One, two, three.
One, two. Okay, great. Hello, Miles. Can you hear us? Yep. Great. It was the first lunch break and we asked some people to go testing. So we may wait like for two minutes. Oh yeah, fine, no worries. Okay, great. Welcome back. Uh, uh, quick announcements. We will have a social event at six after poster session with beer and, and sandwiches. Um, and what else? So, okay. So maybe I'll repeat. Uh, in the evening after poster session, we have a social event. So we'll gather in the courtyard. There is beer, there is little food. So you, you will get to know each other. And uh, another thing is, uh, yeah, some people asked about uh, YouTube recordings. So uh, we are, of course, live streaming the lectures, uh, but we don't know yet uh, how long the lectures will remain and when we can uh, show them later. So this will let you know later. But uh, I would encourage to listen to the lectures in the classroom. Don't, don't rely on YouTube because, <laughs> because maybe you will miss it then uh, in this week. Uh, third thing is about uh, certificates. So during the week, uh, sometime you will receive the participation certificate and confirmation. So don't worry about it. Uh, and the fourth thing is uh, tomorrow evening there is conference dinner and uh, we'll go a bit outside Vienna for that. Uh, and the place is on the hill. So it might get colder there in the evening. So please bring some warm clothes with you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, so let me also say that, I mean, the reason for the YouTube thing is actually for some lectures, we have to edit some of the, some of the parts of the videos. So speakers asked us for that. So this is the reason why we can't really do it during this week. So we will publish it uh, next week on. Yeah. Great. Miles, the uh, stage is yours, please. Thank, thank you. Um, just noticed some mislabeling on that graph there. Never mind. Uh, so I left it and I was asking as the sort of maybe rhetorical question, but um, why, why do you think the, the classical simulator is more speckly or more uneven than the... Um, than the, than the quantum one. See, I see a couple of hands raised. I'll start up there with the first one I saw. Huh? Okay, yeah, who was, I saw a hand here. You, you, okay. Hi, so is it something to do with the signal to noise being better in the quantum case because you get the measurement and you get better noise performance from the uh, your camera instead in the second case you have to deal with the photon statistics because 
you probably let the run, uh, let the camera run freely since you don't get the measurement in the second case so that 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 perfectly plausible answer uh, so i'm going to say that the total event number in both of these cases was very similar so i don't think it's the increased in shot noise is, which is what you're saying the other thing to say is that when you look at the sort of the the, the noise the scale of the noise appears to be um, more than pixel by pixel. If it really was shot noise that we were talking about here, I think one would expect to see um, essentially pixel by pixel variations, where here we've got sort of more clustering. Um, so perfectly, perfectly, a perfectly sensible answer from your part. Um, I don't think it's the case in this case though. So, so any other suggestions? Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm afraid it's not big enough the picture of me all to see whether anyone has their hand up, I, but I can see someone walking. Yeah. Must be with a microphone. Yeah, exactly. That's me. Uh, I was thinking maybe the the um, the homogeneity of the source is different. I mean, the the single photons are produced very homogeneously in the area of the pump in the nonlinear crystal, while maybe the LED. Is not so homogeneous spatially. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think you're warmer. <laughs> so so yes. Um, I, 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 the the source in one case is more homogeneous than the other. The down conversion source is more homogeneous, it would seem, than the LED coming out of the end of the fiber. Now um, I'm probably going to use all the wrong language here. Uh, so I'm going to hold off, and maybe there's a third. Maybe there's a third answer. Is there a third hand up? There, there is one. Yes. Uh, there Excellent. Is one. Let's go for the third hand. Uh, could it be like the surface of the crystal isn't very nice, so then you get some like random reflectivity on the surface instead of something evenly distributed? So that that again, perfectly viable. Uh, I don't think is the case. So I'm now going to say something else that we discovered experimentally in case that gives another clue. If I, leaving the ends of the fiber fixed in place, of course, if I get hold of the middle of the fiber and waggle it from side to side, then the, the classical picture becomes smooth also. So clearly, uh, in terms of homogeneity, um, I'm going to say what was happening is we've got first order classical interference in the fiber, such that the light going down the fiber interferes with itself to create a speckle pattern, leaving the end of the fiber. That speckle pattern illuminates the object and then the object is imaged by the camera. But nevertheless, the image has stamped upon it, effectively the interference, the multi-mode interference that results as classical light travels down the fiber, okay? Now, what could be different about the quantum light? There's only one photon at a time, really. So uh, you're not going to get interference. Uh, well, at least not that kind of interference. Not that kind of interference. I think, I think it comes down to, um, to sort of G1 and G2 mathematically. Um, I think in, in essence, it's a similar reason why when you make a Hong Mandel interferometer, you don't see the individual fringes. Um, you don't see the, the interference in that sense. You only see the, the envelope. Um, and so I just think it's, it, it, it took us a while to understand it. And I probably haven't explained it properly, and I'm sure someone else could do a much better job now of explaining it properly. But I think it's effectively because there's, there's effectively no first order interference would be my um, would be my take on the quantum case. So I'm I'm going to move on past that, and we, perhaps we can have a further discussion offline about it. But I am I am curious, and I say as an experimental observation, it is the case that if I agitate the fiber and continuously agitate the fiber, 
then the, the classical image in the bottom row becomes much clearer. So um, now I've, uh, I've already sort of touched on this question, but I want to come back at it again, because I have to say it's still something that I don't understand. And I would say that it really is something I don't understand in, in the case, as I'm sure one, someone must be speaking to you about this, I'm sure, the wonderful work pioneered in Vienna uh, by Sven Ramelow working with Anton Zeilinger and, and, and others um, on the imaging with undetected photons, where you, again, you've got this sort of mismatch in signal and idler wavelength. I don't really understand what sets the resolution in, in their experiment, uh, but I'm going to talk instead, something I do understand, about what sets the resolution in a classical ghost imaging experiment of the type that we are looking at just at the moment. So let us um, go back to this one. This again is the sort of the classical simulator, which, which I believe is an accurate description of the quantum case. Um, and it's in the, when the object and the image are in the far field of the crystal. So this is relying on momentum correlation. And so one can see straight away that the, the mirror or the crystal is in the far field of the object. And when I restrict the aperture in the far field of the object in an imaging system, then I restrict not the field of view, but I do restrict the spatial frequencies that can be passed by um, that, that's, that system. Now, if everything else I've said is true, we were asking ourselves in the quantum case, well, what's the equivalent of setting the mirror size? What's the equivalent of introducing an aperture in this plane? And I've argued that it should be the, um, the size of the pump beam. So it's the diameter of the pump beam in this configuration, which sets the, the spatial frequencies. Now you can think about this in a number of different ways. If, you know, if I was really thinking about it in terms of the down converted light, what I'd be saying is the diameter of the pump beam governs the number of effective spatial modes which are populated by the down converted photons. And if I want to uh, relay an image from one plane to another, then I ideally need a lot of different spatial modes. That's how I get high resolution. In fact, the number of spatial modes that I have will be effectively related to the, the number of independent pixels that I can do. So let us, let us take this forward. Uh, and so that's what I'm saying there. I am saying, and there's a number of different ways in the classical case, I'm saying that restricting the aperture of the mirror is like introducing a spatial filter into the Fourier plane of an imaging system. In the quantum case, I'm saying that reducing the diameter of the pump beam is like restricting the aperture of the mirror. And in terms of the mathematical strength of the correlations, this is the same, this, this, uh, this um, um, H bar, what was H bar over omega p, if you remember, was the um, was the um, the strength of the spatial correlation. I've now extended that formula, incidentally, to include explicitly the Fourier, uh, sorry, the focal length of the transform lens. So this is the same expression we saw before, but just modified into now into the image plane. And so I'm claiming there that the strength of the spatial anti-correlation in between the object and image plane is given by the focal length of the lens multiplied by the um, wavelength. And again, conceptually, I think that makes sense. The longer the wavelength, the blurrier the image, the longer the focal length, the lower the resolution of the image. And then inversely proportional to the size of the pump beam. And again, that makes sense if I make if I make the pump beam or the spatial filter very, very small, then the, then, then the image is going to get blurrier. So that is what we are expecting to see. And one would anticipate that I can control the resolution of my ghost imaging system by varying the size of the pump beam. And so let's play around with two 
very different uh, geometries here. So we've got the same system as before. And what I've done is I've made it possible to use these entangled photons in two different ways. And so the way we've been talking about up until now is this idea that the object is in one arm. Uh, and then when a photon is transmitted by that object and detected by the bucket detector, that triggers the camera such that it can record the position of the photon in the other arm, essentially the position of the transmitted photon in the other arm. And that's ex exactly as I would expect to see. And as we've spoken before, if I reduced the size of the pump beam, I would anticipate that the resolution of my uh, ghost image is, is, is harmed, is reduced. Now, the other way of configuring the system, and you can see now that what we've done is we've added an intermediate image plane. I can take the object out of that arm, stick it in this arm, and we're just going to call this a sort of heralded imaging system. There's, there's, we're not using spookiness now. We're simply using the time correlation of the photons. And in this situation, I can think of the down-converted light simply as a light source. And whenever a photon here comes, I trigger the camera. So I get still get good signal-to-noise um, sort of rejection of background light. But now there's, I'm placing no real requirements on this light source at all. It could be anything. It could be a single mode fiber. It could be a light bulb. The resolution of the image is purely going to be dictated by the uh, numerical aperture and, and technical competence by which we've set up this second relay chain here. And now as I change the diameter of the pump beam in this configuration, I might envisage that it really makes almost no difference, if any at all, to the, 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 the resolution of the ghost image. So with a large pump beam, I would expect in this consideration a good image. I go there, large pump beam, it, it's a good image. And, and that the ghost image and the heralded image look ostensibly very similar to each other. And now I'm going to go into a small um, pump beam. And I don't expect that because now when I'm here, the small pump beam is liking, acting like a spatial filter in the far field of the object. And uh, that would probably give me a blurred image as I've sort of indicated down on, on, on the bottom right. But if I use it in the heralded position, then um, I, it doesn't matter that I've got a small pump beam. Um, it's, it's just um, essentially spatially filtering the source. And I, you might argue I've got more spatial coherence in the illumination, but to a first approximation, it's not gonna make a dramatic change to the image. So that might be what I'm anticipating. And let us now have a look and, and see what happens in reality. So we've moved away now from the, um, from the, the skull, so to speak, and we've actually put in a semen star, a more conventional test target. And you can see those images at the top. And what we're doing is changing the size of the pump beam uh, from 0.8 millimeters to 0.6 millimeters to 0.4 millimeters. And you can see that in all of those cases, roughly speaking, that the resolution of the heralded imaging system is unchanged because all we're doing effectively is spatially filtering the, the, the down converted light as an illumination source. However, in the ghost imaging configuration, as we anticipated, by reducing the size of the pump beam, we do compromise the um, resolution of the image. And I can think about that in terms of the classical simulator as reducing, you know, introducing a spatial filter into the far field, okay? Or I can go back to my mathematics around the strength of the quantum correlation and realizing that by reducing the size of the pump beam, I am spoiling the strength of the correlation between the signal and idler photons, and therefore I am blurring the ghost image. So I think everything in these results is working as one would have anticipated. So we've spoken a lot about uh, ghost imaging, and I absolutely agree. 
every, the, the, there's nothing I've said thus far that makes me think that a ghost imaging in this sense of the word system has technical practical advantages over a traditional imaging system, particularly if, I, if I'm going to go to a heralded system as I've shown also, I can understand that there are advantages into using a heralded imaging system so that you only turn on the detector when you know there's a photon there to measure, thereby eliminating background light and indeed cutting down on sensor noise. Okay, so I can see that there's advantages in heralding. There may be configuration advantages, uh, other advantages that I'm uh, omitting, but that's why I'm sort of sitting at the moment. Before going on to look at too much more, I also just want to spend a brief moment also to talk about ghost diffraction. So by ghost diffraction, I mean I put the object in one arm, but then rather than sighting my detector in the image plane in the other arm, I sight it in the far field in the other arm and therefore potentially pick up not an image of the object, but the diffraction pattern of the object. And what I want to do now is think about that both in terms of the quantum system, but also in terms of our classical simulator to see whether our classical retrodiction, back projection, whatever you want to call it, model, also gives us a physical insight as to the kind of results we might expect. So this is what I mean. Uh, you can see here we've got sort of, a, we've mixed the two arms. Uh, the top arm is the straightforward imaging system. The bottom arm is the sort of Fourier transform. And, and so you can see that I start off with a double slit. I start off with a light bulb. And as everybody knows, um, when I illuminate double slits with a light bulb, I do not by and large see a diffraction pattern because the light bulb is a extended source. It's certainly not a single mode source. Uh, light is coming at the double slits from lots of different directions. And, and therefore the, the, the far field intensity distribution after the double slit is, is basically a bit of a mess. And so that is what I would like expect to see. If I instead want to see a diffraction pattern, then we all know that all I need to do, all I need to is introduce a pinhole in front of the light bulb, uh, reduce that pinhole down such that it is small in size, such that it is, as far as the optical system is concerned, um, effectively a single mode source. And of course, the size, that size depends on the wavelength and the numerical aperture. And as we will talk about later, another way of doing it is I could fiber couple my light source uh, to, into the system. And I've got a choice. I can fiber couple my light source in two different ways. I can fiber couple it with a single mode fiber, in which case I will merrily get myself a beautiful diffraction pattern. Or I can fiber couple the light source in with a multi-mode fiber, in which case I will probably end up with a bit of a mess. And it will be no surprise to think that actually this is what I'm also going to do with my quantum system. I can start off with a multi-mode bucket detector as we have been using thus far. Uh, and that might be a, a very large detector. It might be a detector which is coupled to the system through multi-mode optical fiber, or I can change that large core optical fiber to a small uh, core optical fiber, a uh, single mode fiber, and use that to couple my system, in which case now I might expect to see a diffraction pattern, a ghost diffraction pattern in the far field. And notice, by the way, that I am in, in both cases. I've got a large pump beam here. The pump beam in this case, the size of the pump beam, because it's in the image plane, of the double slits is effectively setting the field of view of the system. So the pump beam needs to be large enough such that effectively both slits are being illuminated. This small bucket at the top right, it could be a small uh, uh, area um, uh, detector, or as I've said already, in our case, we detected the same, 
and simply change the coupling fiber from multi-mode to single mode. And, and when you do that, you discover that the quantum system, if you want to call it quantum, behaves in um, exactly the way that this model would have anticipated. And by putting in um, a single mode fiber and running every, all the systems, we can see the photons arriving now one by one in the detector plane. And as the photons arrive one by one, you don't really see much of a pattern, but as more and more photons arrive, one realizes, of course, that what one has actually done is, is, is seeing now the, 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 the interference. And so I think this is quite a nice video. At any one time, there is, of course, only one photon in the system, the heralded photon that, that we detect. And, um, but nevertheless, over the many, many, many events, those, the position of those single photons, statistically speaking, is predicted by the normal uh, double, double slit mathematics. But in essence, the take home message I think is, if you want to do not ghost imaging, but ghost diffraction, then the heralding detector in your ghost system needs to be a single or certainly few uh, spatial mode detector. In our case, that was achieved by, by using single mode fiber. So um, some more about diffraction. Um, this is a little aside here because I like it. If, if you don't like it, then don't worry about it because nothing else will depend upon it. Um, there's a wonderful set of papers, quite philosophical papers by Popper, who put forward some ideas around um, quantum mechanics and whether it could be true or not. And I think this sums up his argument, okay? So we've got a down conversion source, we've got photons coming out, I've shown them here coming out in opposite directions, doesn't matter. And they come out and those photons are distributed over a range of angles. And that range of angles, as we've discussed many times, is set by the length of the crystal. So in, in the case of a crystal of, of, let's say, BBO, those angles are likely to be a, a BBO crystal a few millimeters thick. The, 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 however well collimated the pump beam, let's assume the pump beam is perfectly well collimated, the down converted light will not be perfectly collimated. It will be emitted over a range of different angles. And for a crystal that is a few millimeters long, that angle will amount to a few degrees, three, four, five degrees, something like that. And so as I understand the Popper thought experiment, it, what lies at the heart is this. So you go, okay, I will introduce a slit into one arm and that slit is very narrow and uh, will diffract the light that passes through it. So on the right hand side, I've introduced a slit and I've diffracted those photons. My question is, what happens to the photons on the left hand side? So there's basically two choices. One is absolutely nothing. They, the photons on the left hand side statistically speaking, just do what they were ever going to do. The other answer would be when I introduce a slit on the right-hand side to diffract those photons, because the photons are entangled, the photons on the left-hand side also diffract. So this is going to be an A-B vote, okay? There's only two choices. I'm gonna give you the two options, and then I want you to vote. I'm now going to stretch my screen. I'm not going to stretch my screen. Um, I will do my best to see. Okay, option one is when I introduce the slit on the right-hand side, nothing happens to the photons on the left-hand side. That is option one. Option two is when I introduce the slit on the right-hand side, the photons on the left-hand side are also diffracted, i.e. they are spread out over a larger angle. Okay, those in favor of option one, raise your hands now. 
Don't look around. Just close your eyes and, okay? Those in favor of option two, raise your hands now. Okay, so here we are. We all understand. We all thought we understood quantum mechanics. And I think that was roughly speaking a 50-50 split, which either means a 50-50 split or it's 100% of don't really care one way or the other. I'm assuming we care deeply because this would seem to be a very fundamental question in understanding the sources that we have. Okay. Now, I'm hoping there's some brave individuals there. And so of those that thinks that nothing will happen, so I introduce the slit on the right-hand side and nothing changes on the left-hand side. I wonder whether someone who rose their, raised their hand there would care to articulate to us all why they think nothing is the right answer. Do I have any volunteers for articulating the nothing? I can't see. So yes. I, I voted for one, option number one. So my thinking was that we are not measuring it. So, so although they're entangled, the split is, uh, the slit is not like uh, we are measuring it. So it shouldn't um, demolish or it shouldn't um, uh, affect the second photo. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, right, would someone like to articulate why they think, it was the second option, that when I stick the slit in the right-hand side, the photons on the left-hand side do spread over a larger range of angles. So option two, would anyone like to articulate option two? Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'm exactly of the opposite opinion, <laughs> but not in terms of, of measurement, but in terms of global, global state, I mean, the, um, if the two photons are entangled, then acting on, on one also acts on the other, even if it's a unitary. So as I understand, thank you, as I understand the Popper objection to, to, to your interpretation, and I might be naive in my understanding of what he said, he would say if, if it is the case that by inserting a slit on one side, I can increase the spreading of the photons on the other side, then I have found a means of faster than light communication. Because I put the slit in and the photons by the question mark spread out. And I take the slit out, they come back in again. So his concern as to your interpretation is it would seem to indicate um, faster than light comms. Which, which let's assume is bad. Well, I mean, very exciting, but probably not true. And as I understand it, his objection with the nothing happens <laughs> is well, exactly what was articulated. That is, is that not the Copenhagen interpretation? Okay. Now, I, I think this is a fascinating subject and I'm going to try and say a, a few slides now about what I think the resolution is. There's been some great papers written um, in over, over the years, uh, including some by Rodney Loudon, um, a UK physicist. And if you're interested in, in sort of following through this sort of popper problem, then, then, then you should have a look at what he's written. But I'm going to show you some of the experiments that we did and, and explain why there's a, a problem. Now, in essence, um, the problem is that ghost diffraction is not the same as heralded diffraction. We've already seen, I think, that, that as I move my skull from the sort of other arm to the same arm, that the ghost and heralded configurations did not give the same imaging. And, and the same thing's true here of, of, of the heralded um, situation. Now, why is it then that, that this doesn't undermine quantum mechanics? What, 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 what's really going on? And so I'm going to do the same thing here as we did before. Okay, so this is looking at the same ideas as we did before. You can see that I've got an option here. 
I can put my slits in the ghost arm and I can put my slits in the sort of heralding arm. I can move my double slit from one arm to the other. And you would anticipate that both of these, um, um, both of these work, if, if, you see what I, if you see what I mean. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce the size of the pump beam as we did before. And then now what I see that in this case, um, I, I would expect to get a diffraction pattern, but in this case, I wouldn't because I've effectively spatially filtered or I get a massively reduced diffraction pattern. And in fact, you can sort of see here what's going on because this position here on the right-hand side is an image plane of the crystal. As I reduce the size of the pump beam here, I end up essentially reducing the, um, the field of view that I'm going to pick up on my camera. And hence, I'm going to, as I go from big beam to, oops, big beam to big beam, gives me a big field of view at the camera. I can see the fringes. Small beam gives me a small view, field of view at the camera. I can no longer see the fringes. Uh, and now effectively, we did exactly that series of, of experiments um, to, um, to, to show what's going on. Now, another way of explaining all of this is if I don't look at correlations and I just look at every photon that comes out of the system, I will end up with, you know, in these two planes in the far field, some roughly speaking, let's say, circular distribution of photons, which let's, let's assume maybe they're Gaussian in distribution because the, you know, the, 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 the brightest bit of the crystal is on axis. And then as you go to larger and larger angles and the phase matching cuts in, the, the, the down conversion decreases. And if I was to record all of the photons in both arms, both arms would give me just this uniform distribution. And nothing I do over here will affect the distribution over there because there's no faster than light communication. So I can put in diffraction gratings, objects, whatever, fibers, phase plates, and nothing changes on the other side. I still got this big distribution. The only time I'm going to start seeing something strange or something different, whether it be an image or a diffraction pattern, is when I look in coincidence. So in the case of imaging, if I put an object here, such that some of these photons are cut out, and I've got my bucket detector behind it going click, click, click whenever a photon gets through here. If I look at the coincidence detection on the other side, I will see the same image. I will see the same subset of photons from that overall distribution. Similarly, if I put a diffraction grating here, You've got to think that the diffraction grating is effectively ghost imaged onto the other side. And the resolution with which I do that is going to affect whether that diffraction grating functions or not. And once again, all I'm going to do through the coincidence counting is select a subset of the photons which were already there. And I think this is really clear, at least I hope it's clear, in the results I was pushing here. You know, that when I do the heralded um, diffraction, I get beautiful diffraction patterns almost no matter what. But when I do the ghost diffraction, it is subject to the same sort of resolution field of view restrictions that we've discussed previously. So, no matter how small the slit, the diffracted photons sorry, the ghost diffracted photons cannot exceed the distribution of the photons originally emitted by the, by the parametric down conversion. So if I want to see ghost diffraction 
in the other arm, I will need to make sure that my diffraction grating has the spacing between the slits, which is such that the, the fringes, if you like, are contained within what was the original distribution. And all I'm doing is effectively looking at a subset of all of the photons that were there. And it's that heralded, or sorry, it's that coincidence detected subset in which is revealing the pattern. There is no way in which I can use this to signal. I can simply relay the pattern within the confines of the original distribution. Now, if you've understood what I've said in the last five minutes, done very well, because I don't think I barely understood it myself. But I hope I've given you something to think about and, um, and, and read up on the literature, because I think it's a fascinating thing. And, and what I think is fascinating about it is I am sure the number of times I've said to people, oh, yes, quantum entanglement. I put slits in one arm and I see the diffraction pattern in the other. You know, that somehow doing something in this arm changes what the photons do in the other arm. I keep on saying that, and it's just not true. Doing something in this arm means I look at a different subset of photons in the other arm by applying the coincidence counts, but I don't change the singles if you want to think about it in that way. What, you, what the coincidence count does is look at a subset of the counts that were already there. Do you see what I'm trying to say? And, and um, I've realized that there's a misconception that I've carried with me for many years, um, which is not, not true. Right. Um, now, let's go back to those two equations. So in a ghost non-local imaging, it's not the same as heralded imaging. In a ghost imaging system, the resolution can be worse than that arising from the diffraction limit for reasons that I've shown you. I've shown you that if you reduce the pump beam size or in the other configuration, if you make the crystal too long, then you've got a problem. In a ghost imaging system, the resolution can never be better than that dictated by the spatial correlations in the SPDC process. So in the far field, the strength of the correlations is given by this top equation here. And I think, oops, I think what I've tried to say is that fundamentally, fundamentally, this, this imperfection in the momentum correlations arises from an uncertainty in the pump beam's own transverse momentum. And you can work out effectively pretty much what that is. You know, delta X, delta P equals roughly speaking H bar over two or, or whatever. So if I have a width of pump beam given by delta X, you can work out pretty much what delta P is in that pump beam. And that is as good as you can ever hope to get in terms of the strength of the correlation between the two down converted photons. If delta P is, is very, very big, i.e. the beam is very, very small, then the strength of the position of uh, momentum correlation will be very weak. And there's nothing you can do about that. Similarly, when it comes to the spatial correlation, it scales with the, the, the length of the crystal. Uh, and that length of crystal, uh, the longer the crystal, the worse the correlation in position might be. And this is very, very, very closely related to the, uh, the spreading of the down converted light uh, after, the, after the down conversion process. If that spreading is high, then the, the, the spatial correlation between the signal and idler photons is also very strong. Uh, and so short crystals lead to tighter uh, correlations. Now, sorry, Mike, can, can I ask yeah. something? Um, yeah. Here, sigma x is related to the, to the spatial resolution or of the image that you get in the system. Yes. And so the, the limits are basically f and w, p, or, or like the width, width of the pump beam, or? Yeah. So if you imagine that you can bring those closer together, then you can get uh, sub wavelength. 
So is well, that something that it's really related to the technology or is there something more fundamental to it? So to get, to get, I mean, clearly, you know, the focal length of the lens in terms of going into the far field is always going to be, you know, significant. I and mean, if you take even something like a um, times 100 microscope objective lens, the focal length of that is typically 1.6 millimeters or something. Um, and therefore, you know, you then start to think about well, what, how big does the, um, does the, um, you know, the pump need to be in order to reduce that to a sub wavelength correlation. I think it would be a humongous, um, humongous pump beam. Um, in, in terms of the position correlation, then if you want to get close to a, you know, a correlation which is of the order of the optical wavelength, then one is going to need to reduce the thickness of your down conversion crystal so that it's, well, you can see, uh, I mean, if it was six pi is 18, so you would have to be 18 optical wavelengths and then you'd end up with, with this correlation which was as strong as the optical wavelength. So, you know, 18 optical wavelengths, let, 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 let's say of order 15 microns. So, I mean, in principle, one could have a nonlinear crystal that was 15 microns thick, perhaps deposited on a substrate. Bearing in mind, however, with that very thin I mean, the, 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 the chi-2 of most materials means that the down conversion efficiency would be extremely small if, you, if all you had was a, you know, a 15 micron interaction length, then um, you're not, you know, your down conversion process is not going to be very efficient, to say the least. So I, I, I would say that it, it is extremely difficult in either configuration to end up with a, um, a correlation, which is of the order of the optical wavelength. And I think I would go as far to say that that probably applies to any system, mm. a bit bold, any system involving signal and idler photons, if one is relying on the correlation, the spatial correlation of those photons, I think one is always going to struggle at the level of the optical wavelength. Thanks. Because, because of these formulas. Now, um, I agree that the whole math behind imaging with undetected photons is completely different. And I'm, I'm interested you know, what people think as to whether the same restrictions would apply. But I think, you know, what is really, I think is true, and, you know, maybe someone that's built these systems would comment on, you know, in those undetected photon systems, the quality, fidelity by which you image one of the crystals onto the other crystal to create this ambiguity as to where you know, with the, with the objects in between the two crystals, effectively. Um, I think the, the optical fidelity, let's say that, by which one images one plane onto all the other planes is extremely important. And, so I, and I think irrespective of how strong your correlations might be, the, the, the sort of the inherent correlations at, at, in the plane of the crystal, a system is only as good as the fidelity to which those correlations or those planes are imaged onto each other. That would that that would be my guess, but I'm, you know I'm happy to be corrected. But I don't I don't think there's a free lunch available in terms of um, resolution. So I know you know if you go back in the literature you will see some quite dramatic claims made about you know, the potential to have really, really, really high resolution at very, very long distances because you know, the strength of the correlation is very high. I think when it comes to a practical implementation, the, the resolution you end up with is never going to be better than this. 
but could be a lot worse depending on where you've got your restricting apertures. And I, and I think the right way of thinking about that is in the sort of the, the, the sort of classical back projection model. And, and so what I've tried to capture in this image here is, you know, the, at least in concept of putting in, um, you know, aperture restrictions into the system. And by aperture restrictions, I'm also meaning um, scattering, you know, does, does introducing a scatterer mess up the system? And, and the little smiley faces and sad faces are, are meant to say, well, what would be bad news? Uh, I think I've shown you experimentally that if I introduce an aperture into the pump beam, that is bad news for the system. It acts as a spatial filter on the quality of the ghost image. Um, I didn't show you, but I've done. If I deliberately reduce the aperture of any of the imaging lenses such that they begin to clip on the uh, divergence of the down converted light and essentially reduce the numerical aperture of the system, then it is bad news. The only place where one is able to insert a beam spoiler and not suffer image degradation is in this place here between the object and the bucket detector. And you know, it sort of makes sense because you go, well, you know, as long as the light reaches the bucket detector, I don't really care how it got there. It could get there through a small aperture. It could get there through a scattering medium. The whole point of a bucket detector is it's sitting there and swallowing all the light. And But I would also argue that the same thing is true now if I replace my bucket detector with a light bulb. Uh, I can, you know, put an aperture in front of the light bulb and by and large, my microscope still works in much the same way. Now, I, I realize that there's some subtle differences, particularly in microscopes, when one starts restricting the numerical aperture of, of, of the light source. Um, but, you know, there's certainly nothing dramatic there. Um, so I think, you know, again, I do not believe that ghost imaging can see through turbulence in any way that 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 is actually useful uh, beyond that one could anticipate it for an equivalent classical system. Um, the slides here, I put them in just because it's essentially making the same argument in an unwrapped uh, geometry where the sort of input between out, input and output is more clearly defined. Um, I'm not going to go through them, but you've got them on the video to look at them there. Um, what I wanted to do, I've got 10 minutes left. Is that correct? Someone say yes. Okay. Um, I've got a few slides here, uh, which I've just added in, but based on what somebody said earlier on, when we were talking about the noise, and someone said, is it noisy because you don't have enough photons? And the answer is, well, yes, it can be noisy because I don't have enough photons. And so just going back to the results we had before, I've got different lengths of data collection here, different numbers of photon events, leaving aside the sort of scaling. Clearly, when I've got 65 photons, I don't have much of an image. <laughs> when I've got 600 photons, I've got beginnings of an image, and then 6,000, and then 70,000, the whole thing begins to smooth out. So nothing unusual there. I just run the experiment for different lengths of time, sum up, um, uh, and, and go on. And Obviously, to say when it comes to imaging, and I know this is not a lecture course on, um, on image processing, but clearly I can apply image processing techniques to these images and try and denoise them. Nothing quantum about it, but I can make different assumptions about correlations between pixels and the like. Uh, and you know, that borders on to um, you know, compressed sensing or compressed storage. You know, why does JPEG image compression work? It, it, it works because most of my holiday snap, snaps are, are sparse in, not in the real domain, but in the Fourier domain. And, and one can apply that sparsity as a means of improved storage or as a, um, a, or as a means of in, in, in improved image recovery. And, um, Again, I'm not going to go into any detail here. You can read any number of different papers. But 
the thing I really wanted to flag up is that nearly all image processing algorithms and all logic that one sees developed for image processing and denoising assumes effectively Gaussian noise, assumes that I've recorded a pixel intensity and it is subject to some standard deviation based on uh, fluctuations in the source or the uh, sensor noise, dark noise, pick up from background, whatever. They're assuming a Gaussian noise source. Whereas in most of our quantum experiments where the number of photons is low, we don't have a Gaussian distribution. We've got some kind of Poissonian distribution and therefore standard deviation doesn't really mean the same thing. And, 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 and certainly um, Gaussian noise doesn't mean the same thing. And so one needs to take a slightly different approach if you really want to squeeze the most information you can out of the data. And um, there's different ways of doing that and there's different priors. And, and this, this, we spent a lot of time at one point, seemed, seemed a good idea at the time, not using chi-squared as a metric, but as, as log likelihood as a metric, because that works within a Poissonian noise distribution. Uh, and, uh, and, and all the time, all of these sort of compressed sensing algorithms basically are a swings and roundabout cost function optimization, where the cost function has basically two terms. One is how likely is this image given what I actually measured? So one of the things in is, does it fit the data? And the second criteria is, does it fit my preconception about what an image should be? Maybe that's smoothness or whatever. But the uh, one uh, regularizer that I've found actually very successful with these low num photon number images is this total curvature. So I've got an image and I'm going to make the assumption that the sum of the moduli of the second derivatives is small. And clearly that is going to uh, uh, bias the cost function away from every pixel being completely different from the one next to it. So it's essentially a smoothness metric. And when one applies those kinds of um, uh, normalizations or regularizations to the kind of data we have, you go from basically the image at the top left to the image at the bottom right. And so those images which are dominated by shot noise, namely, I recorded 100 photons in this pixel, but let's face it, the real number, or if I did it again, I could equally well get any number between 90 and 110, i.e. 100 plus or minus the square root of 100. Uh, you know, I've got 10%, more. even when I record 100%, 100 photons per pixel, I've got a noise there of 10%. You know, and that's just the shot noise. And so if I want to go from that situation to something where I've got more convincing images, I'm going to have to apply some form of regularization. And there's many different things that one can do and, that, and that's pretty effective. Uh, just some examples here. And then looking at a biological fly wing. Um, so again, starting off in a situation where you've got of order an average of about, I don't know, two or three photons per pixel top left and then applying different amounts of um, sort of, um, I'm going to say smoothing, selective smoothing to them. You end up with images which look a lot more convincing. Right, uh, now the, let's, the last bit of my lecture now, I hope I'm not going to overrun, is, um, ah, wasn't going to do that, is this, and this idea that was spoken about right, right earlier of, uh, I've got my ultraviolet photon. It's going to split up into two photons. I've always been talking about it being 710 and 710. How about if I change the angle of the BBO and my two photons now, uh, one of them's at 460 and the other one's at 1 1.6 microns. Uh, and so you can do that merrily and that happens. The, the, the photons are still correlated in their position. They're still anti-correlated in their momentum. I can still put the object in one arm and the camera in the other arm. And that's quite handy because my intensified camera does not trigger, there's nothing to see at 1.6 microns. The photocathode has zero sensitivity. And any photocathode with a sensitivity at 1.6 microns will be as noisy as hell, as thermally noisy. And so I cannot 
do imaging at 1.6 microns using a time gated camera and that and that is either heralded or otherwise i just it's not going to happen but now i can essentially illuminate my object at 1.6 microns and actually record the position of the correlated photon not at 1.6 microns but at 460 nanometers perfect in the sweet spot of my camera and so that i can do that one can do. But in this case, this is not the super clever imaging without detection. This is still the straightforward ghost imaging. I still do need a bucket detector. I need my bucket detector to measure at, um, at 1.6 microns, but that's okay. Thanks to the telecoms industry, there's lots of people making very good SPAD detectors at 1.5, 1.6 microns. Um, so I can have a perfectly good single photon detector, single pixel at 1.6, 1.5 or so microns. And uh, my, uh, my correlated photon is in the blue. And that's brilliant because my camera really likes blue photons. They're ideal, the quantum the highest possible quantum efficiency for photons around about 460. Uh, and so here we go. And uh, just as a proof of uh, principle thing, uh, we made an object. The object was a silicon wafer. On the silicon wafer was some gold etching. So the 1.5 micron light is transmitted through the silicon, but not through the gold. And so I can make a binary image with my gold on silicon. That binary image is exposed by the infrared illumination at 1.5 microns, but the position correlated photon is recorded at 460 nanometers. And, and, and lo and behold, it works. So one can do this wavelength translation. Uh, now, um, I think what this becomes really interesting is when one pushes the wavelengths further apart. And so I refer you to, for example, uh, to Sven Ramlow's work in, 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 in Berlin, where they've done an undetected photon imaging scheme, which pushes the probe light out to three point something microns. I think that's just amazing work and really important and, and, um, and exciting. So just to show you here that one can do this sort of illumination at one wavelength and, and, and recording images at another. So that is the end of my two lectures for today. In summary, I would say, I think ghost imaging in this context is really, really interesting and has certainly taught me a lot about quantum mechanics, whether it be through Popper, but, but also just more generally in the terms of the power of back propagation, retrodiction. Uh, predicting the outcome of results. In terms of, is it technologically useful? I think the, I don't think it's useful for seeing through fog, smoke, earthworks, um, super resolution beyond what you ever thought was possible. I think maybe there is use in terms of this wavelength transformation, but to be really useful, probably have to see a bigger difference between the signal and idler wavelengths. I mean, something like, I think, lithium niobate will in principle produce downconverted photons out into the terahertz regime. And at that point, I begin to wonder whether there's, you know, would it be interesting if one could probe the object in terahertz and record an image in the visible? And I think the answer probably is yes. I think the technical challenge of doing so is very high but I think that would be an area of interest. Hopefully on Wednesday and Thursday, I will show you some areas where I think that the quantum illumination um, protocols do have something to offer beyond what one can achieve with classical uh, solutions. So I know I've overrun by a couple of minutes. I'm really sorry about that. Um, what I'd, what I'd, I'd, if we have any time for questions, I'll take them. If we're running short, then we'll have to stop. Okay, so thank you very much, Miles. Um, so maybe we have time for one question, but before that, just to confirm, we have the next lecture on Wednesday, the same time, like after lunch, half past one Vienna time. And the next one, the fourth one, will be on Friday, half past 10 Vienna time. And... Uh, Maybe there, actually, because Miles is not here, we can uh, have more questions for him. If you if you have questions and want to discuss, we can maybe do it afterwards, if it's fine with you, Miles. Uh, uh, yeah, no, that's absolutely fine. Uh, my Friday lecture, I will make sure, is short. Um, 
and therefore will leave lots of times for generic questions. I can make sure it's short because I haven't written it yet. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, could, it, could, it could be very short. But in, in fairness, the results I'm going to talk about are only a month old. So that's why I haven't um, done it. Okay, maybe one question um, concerning this two color scheme again. Is there any chance of getting there some uh, increase in resolution, in, in resolution if you uh, did the diffraction limited things? If you have one with one micron and one with 400 nanometer on one, one side, is there any gain? So, I would clearly, I would love to say yes to that. I would love to say I illuminate with the infrared light, but get the resolution of the, of the blue light. Sadly, I don't think that's the case in this configuration. And the, the reason is, comes back to the measurement problem, uh, that leaving aside the true nature of quantum mechanics, I believe that the correlation between the signal and idler cannot be measured to be higher than anything I could measure classically. And so I need to ask myself, let's assume that the signal and idler photons had perfect correlation. What would I actually measure? Well, I've got an image. I basically got two imaging systems here. I've got two sets of relay lenses. On the one hand, I could think of what would I measure in the infrared arm. And the other hand, I can think of what I would measure in the visible arm. And the overall correlation will be sort of probably the convolution of the two. So um, I, I don't think that there's anything, it, you know, even given perfect correlation in the crystal, I think the measured correlations between the two, between the object plane and the image plane will still be subject to classical limits at best. I mean, there's plenty of ways I can make it worse, but at best, I believe, that the overall resolution will be the convolution of the two point spread functions. That's my, that's my understanding. Now that that does not, my understanding does not extend to the imaging with undetected photons. Although my suspicion would be that it does apply, but, it, but I've got no, intelligent basis for saying that. So I don't think there's the resolution enhancement to be had. So thank you very much. Do we have one, time for one more or? Um, or shall we stop and let's, then continue let's next stop now? Is it okay? Okay, yeah. and, and we will continue on Friday. Thanks, thanks, Mans. See you on, see you. Um, yeah, see you on Wednesday. Yep, thank you very much.